Welcome to Off Code, the show where we ignore the cultural codes and have real and intriguing conversations regarding the Black community and ways we can move forward to human flourishing. Hey everyone, welcome to Off Code. I am Monique Dusan. And I am Kevin Briggins, and we are back for another year of Off Code. Um, I'm excited to be back. Um, and I'm and I'm excited about this topic that we're gonna talk about today, which is the topic of gatekeeping. And uh, we're gonna look at what that means across a spectrum of kind of fields and and, and uh, areas. And so uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yes, who are the gatekeepers in the black community? Mm. But before we talk about gatekeepers, let's remind everybody just who Off Code is, what Off Code is, and why we're doing what we do. So first of all, we started Off Code a year and a half ago, right? We started in 2022. Yes. And what Off Code is meant to be is just a conversation, a space, sometimes interviews, where we talk about things that are specific to the Black community, things that either help or hinder the flourishing of black of the Black community. And yes, when we talk about the Black community, um, we are not necessarily saying that Black people are a monolith. We understand that there are specific Black communities. There's a Black community in LA, um, but there's also the Black community in the Bay Area or the Southern Black community or the Black community in Alabama and things like that. So there are micro communities, but a larger macro Black community, there are specific things that are, I would say, pretty consistent among Blacks, no matter if you're in LA or if you're in New York, those things can show up differently to some degree, but they're the larger principle overall is the same thing. Like nobody's walking into Big Mama's house getting crazy with Big Mama. Like we right. know pretty consistently, like that's Big Mama and we respect Big Mama. We also know that at nine years old, I'm, I should not be having my mouth in somebody else's conversation, especially not an adult. I need to stay in a child's place. Now, th these might be things that are adopted by white people as well, but we are talking specifically about the white, I mean, about the black community. It doesn't mean that white people are not invited to, you know, sit in on the conversation. However, these things are specific to us and um, in our community, there are a lot of things happening within our nation that are being blamed on whiteness. And Kevin and I don't necessarily, you know, and I don't let me not speak for you, Kevin, but we don't think that all things can be blamed on whiteness. How are we as, you know, blacks in America taking responsibility for our community, for our families and making sure that we are thriving as people, not necessarily waiting for the white community to come to our rescue or to shift in their thinking about black people if a shift is needed at all before we can enter into thriving i don't know how does that sound for you kevin yeah and i'm glad you said that because i think uh, another part of the explanation is the name off code is because you know, in the black community this thing about being on code which means we don't say certain things in public or in mixed company right we stay on code we stay on message we stay on brand um but there are things behind the scenes, these conversations we have that are the real conversations about what we really believe and how we really feel. And we decided, you know what, we need to have these conversations out front because having one conversation in the public and then behind closed doors, having the real conversation is basically disingenuous. And so what you were talking about, all these things being blamed on whiteness, the people who do that, they do that in public and they get behind closed doors and they say, so-and-so need to stop acting like that. So-and-so need to get their acts together. They do, you know, the real, real comes out, but they won't say that in public because you don't say something negative about um, a black person. You don't put family business in the street. All these terms yeah. of kind of keeping this code, this public face to where we don't look bad in front of white people, right? Mm -hmm. This really is all it's designed to do. And we also, we don't lose our political power because since the 1960s, the black community has learned that their political power been taught their political power comes through their grievance. So as yeah. long as we can keep white people in a position of grievance where they owe us because of past injustices, then we feel like we have them, you know, kind of by the neck and we can use that to our own advantage, you know. Uh, oh, that's so, so good. Yeah. And so yeah. that's why we're like, no way, let's, we, let's stop doing this two-faced thing and let's just have yeah. these real conversations out front. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah. I, I, I appreciate the, the fact that you hit on, like we've been taught about grievances and that as long as we keep our grievances public, then we have something to complain about to require change or societal shift about. And that keeps white people in a specific area. But behind closed doors, we're like, oh, who can need to get himself together? Mm-hmm. So there is some thought about the autonomy of a person, regardless of skin color. Like this black person needs to do something about his life and get that together, regardless of the system that's out here. Yep. But yep. publicly, the system is what is keeping Pookie down. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a political game. And we talked about it in our last episode with Delano about how the the uh, the upper class blacks use the struggle of lower class blacks to benefit themselves. Mm-hmm. Is right. So they'll take the grievance of, you know, what's largely found of things in the poor black community. They would say, and because of this, therefore, I should get this position. I should be the president of Harvard. I should, you know, because I'm black and that you owe us this, right? And because mm-hmm. this struggle we're going through and these people are so well off. They mm-hmm. have no struggle. They're at the mm-hmm. top elite of society, but yet they will play to the plight of poor blacks and use that plight. And knowing the whole time, nothing they advocate for actually helps those people. They're just using yeah. them. Right. Yeah. And so um, that's one of the reasons that this conversation, these, these, this double conversation needs to go away. And let's just be real. Let's just yeah. be real. I hear you. One of the things he said was, um, you know, we don't want to we don't want to have these conversations in front of white people. Mm-hmm. And it makes me think about the Cat Williams interview. And so let's talk. Let's let's get into that, because in the Cat Williams interview, he mentioned that someone brought him in either to read lines or to have a conversation about a script. And he wasn't feeling it. And he said, now, here I am in front of all these good white people. And I almost fell out. <laughs> I was like, yes, because. We don't like you, if we gonna have a conversation, we need to have this conversation. But I gotta also be real. So now in front of all these good white people, I gotta let you know the truth. Mm-hmm. What were your thoughts about the Cat Williams interview? And oh yeah, now I won't even leave it. Go ahead. What was your what okay. was your thoughts? On um, well, no, for we we should just have to say the Cat Williams interview because I think everybody knows what the Cat Williams interview is. But for those yeah. who don't, uh, Cat Williams, who's a comedian, went on um, Club Shay Shay, which is Shannon Sharp's podcast. And he aired some grievances. He was tired of people um, saying things about him on that particular podcast. So he wanted to go on to set the record straight. And he set the world on fire. Well, I said the world on fire. I think I was talking to someone else. A lot of this conversation is contained within the black community. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people outside are really tracking what's going on because this is an internal cultural type fight. I mean, most people outside of the black community probably know who Cat Williams is. Mm-hmm. They know a lot of people he's calling out, like Kevin Hart, the bigger name comedians, you know, Steve Harvey, Cedric the Entertainer. Um, but Man, Cat terms, Williams has been my favorite comedian for years. Who you, look like, you? You, you look like Cat Williams would be your favorite comedian. When he did that thing about poor little Tink Tink, and he said that that man with the false legs looked like his stuff looked like some bent, bent paper clips. Ah. Ah. He said, Polo Tink Tink. Like I said, you look like Cat Williams would be your favorite comedian. I know. Yeah. Cat, and Cat the prime Williams. Cat Williams. Cat Williams with the relaxer, the yeah. slick Cat Williams. I can't. I'm, I'm done. Go ahead. Yeah, and so Cat Williams goes on this interview, and it, the thing is, it's three hours long, and so they covered a lot. Um, the things that got the most attention was he made accusations of comedians stealing jokes, some of his jokes, the bigger name comedians. Um, but one thing he he talked about too that was very interesting was this idea of gatekeepers in the entertainment community, All right? And so he was talking about the fact that these people who have made it, quote unquote, who had these large platforms weren't the most talented comedians. And he's proven that by showing that they're stealing our jokes, the people who aren't making it, who aren't on that level. Why are you stealing my jokes? Him, um, Mark Cooper, you guys remember the show Hanging with Mr. Cooper back in the day? Yeah. Steve Harvey ripped out, ripped off a whole routine from him. 
and mm-hmm. uh, it was it's just crazy to see, you know, because the, the old videos are coming up of these other comedians doing these jokes and these routines, and then he's like, oh wow, he did steal that, right? The internet um, comes through. Yeah, the internet so is the like, undefeated winner of 2024. Yeah, so it's not like all oh, these execs like, man, we found the funniest people. Let's give them a show and let's do this. It's like no. These people are hand selected for some reason, or they've made it for some reason, other than they are the m- most talented or the funniest, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of what he was exposing. Um, and he was talking about the things that you have to do to to make it. And his claim was that he wasn't willing to do those things. And so yes. the the people who aren't willing to do those things, they don't get the platform. They don't get. <laughs> okay, I'm. Cat Williams is a comedian, and some of the things he says is over the top and exaggerated. You got to kind of pick out what's real yes. and what's not. Because you now you talked about how you um one of the things you get in the perks is you get a a light skinned wife, right? And so now all the pictures are going around all these comedians' wives, and yes, they all do look like similar type of women. But at the same time, we know mm-hmm. men who are well off tend to date those type of women anyway. Like it's just, but he's playing on all of those things. So he's making all these like, accusations saying like, look, when you make it, when the system, when the man puts you in place, look, they give you this kind of wife, right? And then he's, he's making this argument, this whole thing is fixed and set up by these gatekeepers and the people who we look at as the biggest comedians, the ones who have made it, they, they're in those positions because they compromise, they do the things that are, that they have to do to get along, to walk the line. Um, and one of those things he talked about, um, which was something that we talked about in our last episode with the Lotto Squires about the feminization of the black voice or the and or the black male voice, was that if you're gonna make it and you're gonna get it big, you gotta put the dress on. And yep. that that resonated because there seems to be a lot of truth to that. And other people have told Dave Chappelle told a story um, mm-hmm. about, you know, he was on, I forgot what show he was on, what movie set. And they came in one day and he got in this trailer and there's a dress in there. And he's like, I'm in the wrong trailer. And they're like, no, dang, we got this great idea. You're going to, mm-hmm. he's going to sneak you out the prison and going to put you in the dress. And you're like, he's like, no, no, that, why I got to put a dress on? Like, y'all don't come up. Like, that ain't, that ain't funny. Like, I can be funny. Like, let me do funny, but like, I don't have to be in a dress to be funny. And he went back and forth. And eventually he said, they said, okay, Dave, all right. And, but it was just big push to try to put him in a dress. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and Cat Williams was making those same claims about that's what they try to do to you. Yeah. Um, they put you in the dress. They, to a degree, you know, humiliate you and say, oh, this is what you're going to do if you want to make it. Right. Um, he talked about, advances from certain producers, male producers, like they want you to do certain types of favors for them. Right. Mm -hmm. He said he was approached with that. And so he's, he's, his claim is that all of these guys are bought and sold. They've compromised themselves to make it. And those of us who are more talented than them, who don't make it, who aren't in the in club, we aren't there because we wouldn't, we wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the firestorm that he set off in the past week or so. And last time I checked that interview had over 37 million views. And so I'm pretty sure it's more than that now, but we checked it last last night. It was like 44 million. Oh my goodness. Yep. Can we get 44 million views on off code? Y'all like and subscribe and share. Exactly. <laughs> but I think it's I think it's really interesting that there that his accusation, which has come out now, I feel like it was a couple years since Dave Chappelle originally started to talk about this and mm-hmm. you know what you do and, and what you don't do and putting on that dress and all of that, that, you know, there's there seems to be this thread, at least between those two, of I need to you know, be more fit. I need to play a feminine part or I need to play the part of a woman in order to be successful. Yeah. So it's like, well, what is, 
Where does that come from? And why is there a need to see black men in a dress? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't get, I don't know what drives it, but when you look at all the comedians, there's a, it's a collage of screenshots going around. They've all yeah. done it. Yeah. Um, it's just like this common thing that they're, that they're forced to do. And it's, it just makes no sense. You know? But is, is that, I wonder if that's the cost of stardom or the cost of success industry. I have no idea. I'm not in the industry, but you know, if that's the cost, are we now compromising? Like is Tyler Perry or Martin or Eddie Murphy, you know, compromising in order to get to that place of, of fame and stardom? I think Cat Williams would say yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to do a hundred percent cross the board type deal. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't think there's any surprise or any revelation that there are gatekeepers within the entertainment industry. Um, anybody who's ever tried to make it in the industry. Um, so I was around guys who were trying to get record label deals. Mm -hmm. Super. The most talented artists aren't the ones who get the contracts. I'm just going to say that. Um, I knew some very, very talented guys that were, had everything you would think you would want in a, in a, an artist that was promotable, had the look, had the skills, and they're not the ones who get the deal. Somebody else does. And you just don't know what's the deal between the people who are the gatekeepers and who gets in and, and, and who doesn't. Right. Um, and so in the entertainment industry, that's always been a known thing. Um, I, I had someone who was an actor, um, and they pulled out of a role because of a commitment they had made to their church. And they chose to keep that commitment, even though the conflict came up and it ruined their career. Wow. I mean, that was it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and so it was one of, it's just one of those things of, yes, there, there are rules you have to play by. There are things you have to do. And if you're not willing to do those things, then don't try to make it right. Uh, to, 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 to that degree, there's some level because even Cat Williams, we know who he is. He's successful. He has Netflix specials, right? Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the the top of the mountain, you know, you no, know, Cat Williams isn't, isn't hosting family feud. You know, um, he's, he, he's not getting his own TV show. He's not in the Hollywood. He's not leading a Hollywood blockbuster movie with yeah. the rock. You're, you know, that's yeah. just not going to happen. Um, and so, I can say, I don't know how much of it was a, a revelation of new things, but man, it set the internet on storm. Like I say, the 44 million views, everybody's done a reaction to it. Everybody's talking about it. I can't go through my social media feed without everybody, you know, posting things. I've seen so many of the previous old videos of jokes that they stole that he claimed they stole. And then these are old videos resurfaced. Yeah. Oh, wow. He was telling like the truth. Like jokes from the eighties. Yes. Um, the designing women joke. Did you see that one? Yes. Yes. That yes. is crazy. Yes. Said yes. the entertainer stole a joke from the old TV show, Designing yes. Women. <laughs> yes. I wanted to take a minute to tell you about something really cool. It's called the Commuter Bible. Now, I know that many of you are gearing up to start your read through the Bible plan. Maybe you've done it in years past and you just want to have a refresher. The Commuter Bible is a wonderful way for you to listen to the entire Bible in a year, but it's delivered to you as short podcasts that you can listen to them as you commute. They're delivered to you Monday through Friday. It's pretty cool. They have three plans for you to choose from. There's a read through the New Testament plan, read through the Old Testament, or read through the entire Bible. So if you're reading through the New Testament, you gotta have a short commute, you know, maybe 15 minutes. You wanna read through the entire Bible, a little bit longer commute. Maybe it's a 25 minute commute. Either way, all the plans are totally free. You can go check out their website, commuterbible.org. It's so cool. It's the whole Bible in a year as a podcast. It even has little introductory notes to set the context and music to help break up the monotony of the, the speaking. It is free on your favorite podcast app. Go check it out commuterbible.org. 
Okay. Okay. Let's switch gears and talk about the Harvard Claudine Gay, which is something else that's been in the news recently. Yes. So Claudine Gay is the president or was the president of Harvard, one of the most prestigious schools in the United States or in the world. She had been president for six good months. So the equivalent in black minutes of about 10 good minutes. And now she has been forced to resign. I think it was her choice to resign, but you know, there was a lot of pressure on her to resign after the anti-Semitism um, statements and sentiment behind the October 7th ordeal. But all of like black Twitter is going crazy talking about that this is just further proof that the systems and structures of America and of a establishment or institution like Harvard were never really meant for her anyway. They were never really meant for black people anyway. And thus, this is the reason why we need DEI, um, anti-racism and all of that affirmative action, like all of these things. And it just the her, her resignation or her ousting really is simply the revelation and, and the uncovering of a system not meant for black people, especially not black women. Black church in many black churches have also taken the same sentiment as black Twitter as, you know, this is a sin. This is, you know, against God. This is, you know, a, an egregious offense toward the black community. So she survived the anti-Semitism stuff. They kind of stood behind her. What got her yes. fired was the plagiarism uh, things that got revealed um, that came out. And it was, a, it was... This is the thing. It wasn't like a sentence or here or there. There were whole paragraphs that she lifted from other people's work and put in her work. It wasn't like it was just one person. No, no. She did it a lot. And Yes. And it's the thing. To be the president of Harvard and only have 11 published papers, that is super low. So to a degree, when you, you were setting up your question, they are kind of right that they're making the argument that black people need DEI because we need below average black people to get positioned and not qualify for it. Yeah. If that's, that, if that's what you're trying to do. Then yeah, you need DEI because she was not qualified for the position. But here's the thing. So she lifted stuff from the auntie Carol yes, Swain. She yes, she did. Now, if Carol Swain is good enough for Claudine Gay to lift stuff from. I wonder if Harvard gonna reach out to the very right Carol Swain to be their next black president, if it's truly about diversity. Yeah, you know what? And I don't know why they would. Mark Lamont Hill said that the next president needs to be a black woman. So Carol Swain fits that description, right? Yes, she does. But you know what she don't fit? She don't fit the hoodwink and bamboozle that comes along with DEI and affirmative action. Exactly. Exactly. She, but she would actually be qualified for the position, but they won't give Isn't it to her because. Harvard alum, or did she go to Yale? I'm not sure. I don't know where she went to school. I know she works at Vanderbilt. She she's a professor at Vanderbilt, so that says it all right there. Um, yeah. But no, she wouldn't get it because she's actually qualified. She went to Yale. She went to Yale. Yeah. Yeah. See, so um, she's actually the, qualified. I, and someone said that. This is proof that black women is, to be qualified isn't good enough. You got to be like overly good and all. Like, no, just don't steal other people's work. Exactly. I mean, when you think about Carol Swain, Carol Swain then dropped out of high school. She was a teenage mother. She she literally had to walk the steps to become who she is. A published author, like well respected, but she don't let you own her mind. Yeah, She does yeah. not place her mind on the conveyor belt of de democratic um, thought process. So, so let's tie go down in. this whole, go ahead. No, it's like, so let's tie this into our first topic. Mm -hmm. In this situation, Carol Swain would be Cat Williams. She's more qualified. She's funnier, right? 
but she's don't she doesn't get the platform because she won't capitulate to the, the gatekeepers, right? Yeah. She won't hold those stances that are required to be held to yep. fit you there. Right. Yep. Um and so that's what we're talking about. That's that is kind of the common thread between all of this. Um our buddy Jason Whitlock and Stephen A. Smith are going back at it. Um uh. Jason Whitlock is making the same accusation. Stephen A is where he is because he capitulates to the gatekeepers. I'm outside because, you know, I wouldn't do what they you know wanted me to do. I wouldn't compromise. And so mm-hmm. so everybody is kind of coming out with this common thread of. And we know this, there's a certain line you have to walk to reach certain places, right? And it's not the line that we in the black community claim. They claim, oh, you got to act white and you got to do all of this. You got to, no, 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 no. You got to be super black, right? You got to be super woke. You got to be down for the cause. You got to make black people out to be victims. You know, you got to keep the the grievances going. You know, you got to capitulate to everything of the Democratic Party. Those are the things you have to do if you want the high seats. The minute you you have conversation like we're having now, oh no, you're done. Yeah. Yeah. No, they'll never put you in that position. They'll never put Carol Swain in that position. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like you sent me the article about the top black economists in in America and Thomas Sowell's not on it. How? How sway? Exactly. You know, exactly. it's like it's the it's the gatekeepers. Yeah. And if you don't hold to the right ideas, you don't walk the walk the line and espouse the ideology they want you to. They're not going to um, acknowledge you, highlight you, or anything. And so yeah. it's not race. That's the one thing I want to get across to people. It has nothing to do with race. It's all about ideology. Exactly. All about ideology. Exactly. Um, so yeah, yeah. Claudine, this whole Claudine Gay situation has made me think about. The not the model minority, but it's kind of like a new level of of minority on minority violence mm-hmm. or black on black. We would say black on black crime, but when you think of you know those over in Israel at being you know Jewish and not being you know part of the gosh. I would say more of like a a larger evangelical Christian or, you know, being, I would, I would consider them in some of this conversation, a minority. When we think about a black minority and, you know, a Jew or the conversations that have happened since October 7th and um, anti-Semitism and things like that, I feel like it, it's kind of this minority on minority, but what minority are you that gives you the right or quote unquote power to be able to speak against another minority? When you think about Carol Swain and Claudine Gay, it's minority on minority, black on black. But depending on where your ideology lands, the one of these minorities gets to speak poorly of or do violence against another minority. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, is what um, um, Herbert Marcuse called repressive tolerance, where you mm. allow one behavior from the left, then you condemn that same behavior from the right. We yes. see it all the time. Um, yes. um, we see it, you know, there the one side can protest and burn cities and do all this stuff, the, and it's, you know, mostly peaceful protests. It is, you no, know, we hear your voice and all that, you know. And 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 rioting is the the voice of the unheard. And then, if the other side of out does it even one time, it is the worst thing since Pearl Harbor and nine eleven and all of these things. And it's just it's, it's made such a big deal. And so that that is an actual um, strategy, right? Um, and and it's it's depicted that way for a reason. And so um, they they're promoting one side and their actions and then condemning the same exact action from the other side um, and being very double standard and hypocritical, but that's intentional. Yeah. Um, One thing that we can talk about in terms of, of gatekeeping, because that's kind of the common thread we're talking about is, is gatekeeping within the black church. I know a lot of faithful black pastors who have no platform because they don't, they don't say the right things, right? They say the, the things that are true, but they don't say the things that get you a platform. 
or it gets you in the good graces of, you know, the the TDJs to Jamal Bryant. So, you no, know, that uh, what we call, you know, gatekeepers of the black church kind of did. Mm-hmm. Um, and so William Murphy. Yeah. Yeah. All, mm-hmm. and, and honestly, it's so unhealthy because the the ones who are kind of the common thread is that the ones who are faithfully doing it are not the ones who get put on the pedestal. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think that's something that we can kind of kind of expect from because when we talk about the pedestal, we talk about the platform and to a degree, we're talking about the world. Right. Yeah. What does the world accept? What does the world promote? Uh, who does the world promote? Right. And to be promoted to that level and to, to reach those levels. A lot of times you have to abandon the truth of the gospel. You have to abandon the truth of scripture. You know, you can't, you know, you got to walk it out in church, you know? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> You, you know, know you, you got you got rock you, with it from the pulpit. You got to bring in Stacey Abrams. You got to uh-huh. be an advocate for uh, abortion and and all of these types of things that get you. As I, I like to say, you know, it's almost like the the black preachers always compete to be the next Dr. King, right? They want to be that pastor that is standing next to the mayor when the mayor is doing his press conference, right? You know, and so to get there, you got to toe the line. Yeah. You got to promote what they want you to promote. And on Sunday before the election, you got to let them come up and get that platform, get that mic. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so, yeah, these gatekeepers and people compromise to, 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 to quote unquote, make it is, is across the board. Yeah. And I, you're hitting on a good point. The, the reality that if you are preaching a certain type of way, a certain type of style and a certain like word faith message it's not it's not acceptable and i'm not saying that you know all preachers who you know hoop and holler on a on a sunday are completely out of pocket and you know unscriptural unbiblical i'm not saying that Ooh, at all we, we can have the good bishop wooden on again don't plan oh, hey yes <laughs> um but bishop wooden ain't gonna get a platform like no. jakes would no. Because he's going to call out Beyonce and Stacey Abrams while Creflo and Bishop Wooden, or not Bishop Wooden, but um, Bishop Jakes and William Murphy would gladly welcome them without repentance. You know what I mean? Like, you, yeah. you don't need to repent. You just need to come on in and, you know, flow and be a part of our community. I'm not saying that Bishop Wooden wouldn't welcome them in, but there would be conversation. I do believe he would be like, that ain't okay. Yeah, this is ungodly. Uh, yeah, um, you, Bishop Wooden ain't gonna, is not going to get a seat next to Oprah. It, that she's not, you know, she's not bringing him on. Um, on in line with that, you know, while you and I were kind of taking a break, uh, me and and Jason Whitaker deal what Christian was doing some reaction stuff, and one of the things react we we reacted to was Kurt Franklin's interview on Club Shay Shay. Um, <sighs> Yeah, and it was so disappointing because we were talking about those gatekeepers. He had every opportunity to clearly explain the gospel, clearly hold Shannon to you know an account. Uh, they just won't do it. They won't mm-hmm. do it because they know the way you get in that seat is you water it down, you tone mm-hmm. it down. Um, and we saw it with Lecrae when Lecrae was on ESPN. And they threw him yes. a softball question about spirituality in his music, and he took it to a soul and Aretha Franklin. Mm-hmm. Just keep Jesus out of it, yeah, and you'll make it, right? The gate is just as long as you come right, you come correct. The gatekeepers will let you in. They'll pick they'll give you a platform, you know. Um, but if 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 you stand on the truth, you stand on the gospel, you stand on scripture, you stand on the fact that men can get pregnant and all, and the things we know are true and then no, you, you're, you're not going to get the gatekeepers going to keep you out because they're pushing what we can honestly say is a, a demonic worldview, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the darkness hates the light. And so we, we should not be surprised that we don't get the platform from the world, right? We shouldn't be surprised that uh, the world would ask you to compromise to bring you into it and then offer you riches 
offer you women and wealth and, and cars and houses and all of this stuff. All you got to do is this is all you got to do is do this. All you got to do is tell them to dress. All you got to do is really talk about faith. Just just have faith, but don't mm -hmm. go to Jesus on us. Right. Mm -hmm. Just you no, know, just those types of conversations, those types of things. Um, and those things are tempting and people take it. Yeah. Wow. Well, this has been a good conversation. At least good I way to start the year off. Yeah. Talking about the gatekeepers. You guys stand strong against the gatekeepers anyway. Yeah. Thank you for having the conversation. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. We will see you guys in two weeks. Bye.